Hey, I want to say how exciting it is also. We're a part of a growing church, and whenever you're growing, one of the things that kind of indicates that is when you see people step across that line to follow Jesus. And then not only do they say they want to follow Jesus, you know, uh, just kind of verbally, they end up going ahead and making that public declaration of baptism uh, and identifying themselves with Christ. And last week we saw 20 24 people, I believe, last week that stepped across that line. And I want to congratulate, if you got baptized last week, let me just say a big, a big congratulation. It's amazing. We're not trying to be, if you're new around here, we're not trying to be a big church. We want to develop disciples. We're about loving God, loving people, and developing disciples who will follow Jesus as we do that together. Well, we're in this series called Don't Waste Your Wilderness. And I want to start off by asking you this question. How well do you follow directions? How well do you follow instructions whenever they're given? There are three words that kind of send a chill up my spine, and it's this. Some assembly required. I know that the next few hours there are going to be things that are exposed that are within my heart because words that come out of our mouths, Jesus said, shows what's in our heart. And I struggle with attention and, and details and instructions and listening. And uh, I'm just curious, how many of you, whenever you've got something to put together, uh, you, uh, you lay all the parts out organized, you do this, okay, and you read through the instructions, and you make sure that every, how many of you do that, okay? How many of you are like this? I knew there'd be psychos in here, okay, to do that. Seriously, though, we need you because how many of you, you are maybe like me a little bit in this, you, you, you look at the instructions, you, you don't organize things, maybe your brain doesn't work like that, and you kind of think this, I got this, all right? And then yeah, how many of you do that? How many of you do that? How does that work out? We definitely need the people who, are, uh, who raised their hands a moment ago because uh, my wife is one of those. She pays attention and she reads instructions, and the way we do it now is I'm like, you tell me what to do, and I will do the work. That works well in our message, okay? I mean, in our marriage. And, uh, and so she helps with that. She pays attention. We follow the plan. But uh, how many of you, you don't even look at the instructions? You just wing it. Anybody do that? Okay. We knew there'd be some of those in the crowd as well. How, how about whenever someone gives you directions or instructions, sometimes you think, that doesn't sound right. I got a better way. Anybody ever think like that? Or, you know, it doesn't look right, it doesn't, you know, and the way that maybe they're telling you to do it, I, I, man, I guarantee I can figure out a better way to do this. Well, sometimes, and what we're going to find is that as God leads us into wilderness experiences, it seems like there's a better way at the surface. And, and again, we will discover that in this series we've been in, Israel, this nation of Israel who has been held captive in slavery for 430 years. They were going, they had been promised the promised land. They were going to be delivered. Moses, who was a Messiah-type figure, would come by the power of God, bring rescue to them. And, uh, and we would see these massive plagues that God would bring through Moses' hand. And it was God's authority. And Pharaoh's heart would turn and he would release these captives who had been there for 430 years, okay, they had this slavery mindset amongst themselves, and God said, I'm going to take you to a promised land, and there's this short route to get there, but God doesn't take them that way. He doesn't take them the way that on the surface we would think that this is the way you should do this, God. Instead, he takes them down south instead of up north where the promised land Canaan was, he takes them down south into the wilderness because God is about to begin to do a work in their lives to get them ready for what's next. Today we're going to be in Exodus chapter 16, okay? And, and let me just give you a little recap. Maybe you're new with us here today or maybe you've missed a few weeks and haven't, haven't been up with us. But again, God has been, God has been doing this work within them. He, he takes them out of, out of Egypt. He leads them. And, and it's crazy because it seems like he leads them to this place where they're going to be trapped. And essentially they were. There's a pillar of fire uh, by night and a pillar of cloud by day. He's providing. That pillar is his presence. He's providing for them in the wilderness. But they, they have their backs up against the wall at the Red Sea. You know the story, how it goes. God, through Moses again, parts the sea. They go through on dry ground. The, the, the Egyptians are coming after them now to recapture them, to kill many of them. God protects them. That water washes over those Egyptians and drowns them. And then we find in, in Exodus chapter 15 that they are praising God. 
They are fired up. They are singing and dancing and worshiping at the deliverance of God. By the way, all of this we've been learning is a great picture of what our redemption looks like. We have been in bondage and slaves to sin, but we needed a Messiah to come and to, and to set us free and to, to take us through those, those, those impossible waters, right? And God does this and God collapses down on our greatest enemy, sin and death. And we've been rescued by Jesus, the Messiah. It's a picture of redemption, but we don't go straight to heaven. We go into the wilderness and that's where we are now. We're in the wilderness where God is doing this work and what we discovered is that in Exodus 15, they're praising God, but three days later, their praise turns to panic whenever they start running out of water. Three days later, their worship begins to turn into worry. You, you ever get like that? I know that I do. Where I could be praising God on a Sunday, and then something happens during my week, and it's like I have forgotten everything that God has done within my life. Most of all, he saved me from an eternity separated from him. What we see is that God is going to tell them this. All I want you to do is I want you to follow my directions. I want you to do what I say as I lead you in the wilderness. And he gives them some things. In Exodus 14, we see this. He says, fear not, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. This is when their backs were up against the Red Sea. And then, of course, he does that. We said it like this a few weeks ago. God was telling them, when you're in the wilderness, fear not. Stand still, watch God work. Rest in him, trust in him. He's beginning to teach them and train them. Many of them did not know what Yahweh, who he was and what he was like, even though they had heard about him. Many of them had probably adopted a lot of worship of Egypt at that point. And we see this, that their praise after this rescue begins to turn into panic. Gratitude, where they were overflowing with gratitude, quickly turns to grumbling, they were going to discover how fair weather they were in their faith. And you know, whenever I read this, so many times I, I, I have this, this uh, tendency to go, I can't believe they did this again. I can't believe they did it over and over again. But this is what the Lord will speak to my heart is, Bart, what I'm showing you is that you can be, and many of us, you can be exactly like this. There are these familiar patterns that we return to, we see God do something great, we, uh, but, but as soon as there's an obstacle, we begin to question, God, are you in control? God, do you have a plan? I see the plan, but it doesn't look like a good plan. God, do you care about me? God, do you love me? We saw God do all of that, but again, as soon as another obstacle in the wilderness presents itself, what we find is this, is that we have kind of like this selective memory Here's a, here's a principle that you can kind of take away from this. By the way, whenever I read this text, I read it with one eye on the text, seeing how they behaved, but I also have to take another eye and look straight in the mirror because I do many of the same things over and over and over again. And I know that you're probably like me in that. But here's what we find, the spiritual principle to be true in this. We often forget what we should remember. We often forget what we should remember and we remember what we should forget. We will focus in on things that really we need to let go of, and we will obsess over those things, and, and, and you know, but here's what we will do. We really, there's some of those things we need to let go, but what we really should do is we should remember who is in control, who is, who is the one who loves us, who's, and this is when anxiety begins to creep into my life. I've shared with you very openly, there are times in my life where I battle with anxiety, and I find that whenever I start getting anxious about things, it's because I've forgotten who my Lord is and what kind of control he is in. And I begin to focus on these other things. I forget the very thing about how he has saved me. He has saved me from an eternity separated from him. And I start obsessing over can he even handle this situation that's going on in the moment where I find myself in the wilderness. And this is what we see. You know what I've discovered about myself? It's not a natural thing for me to be grateful in the wilderness. It's not natural for me to be in this place, or you. Our, our sin nature, our, our, the human part of us, we don't want to be grateful. We, we, we really want to focus on these other things. But what God is going to do is he's going to teach us. He's going to train us in the wilderness. He's reshaping us in the wilderness. So they start grumbling in the water situation, and now we're going to find that they're going to be grumbling again. But how does God respond to their grumbling? 
God, we're going to see, gives grace upon grace upon grace, even in your grumbling. And i got to tell you, I'm so grateful for this. We see this picture of God's grace. You could call this message, here we go again. Because it's this familiar pattern. And again, we read it and we think, how could they do this? Of everything that they've seen that God has done, but here they go again. Look at Exodus chapter 16. We're going to look at a lot of scripture this morning, okay? And it'll be up here, but you can follow along with me on your device or in your Bible. Then the whole community, that's, that's upwards to a couple million people, of Israel set out from Elam. If you'll recall, Elam was where God took them from the bitter waters of Marah, where he turned it sweet. This is what God can turn even bitter things sweet by his presence. And he leads them a few miles down the road to a place called Elam. It was an oasis. It was living waters. And it was a representation of how God satisfies us, even in this desert, even in this wilderness, with living water. And it says that they journeyed into the wilderness of Sin. Now, that looks like sin, and you think there must have been a lot of sin to get that name. Okay, it's a derivative of Sinai, and there was a lot of sin in that wilderness with them, but that's not why it's called that. They arrived there on the 15th day of the second month, one month after leaving the land of Egypt. They're four weeks in on a road trip. How many of you like road trips? Anybody like to go on a road trip? You probably got some coming up. How many of you love road, road trips when you have little kids? How fun is that? Okay, that's exciting, isn't it? Always fun. And, uh, and, and so can you imagine a month-long road trip with your kids in the back seat and how many times you have to threaten to pull over and do whatever you need to do and it's like you're, you're taking them to Disney World or somewhere, and what do they do the whole time? They're fighting, they're complaining, they're, you know how it goes. I did that whenever I was a kid too, and my parents were taking us on a road trip, and it says in verse 2, there to the whole community, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. Okay, and so there's this, that word complained is this word grumble. It's a grumbling now, one of the things that we teach around here is that God desires for us to, to be real with him. Authenticity is big with us. We find that in the Psalms that God, God says it's okay for us to cry out to him, to groan. Here's what I want you to hear. There is a difference in groaning to God and grumbling about God. And this is where there was a difference here. It's, it, we should groan in, in our tough moments. We can groan in the wilderness and God hears those, those cries, and he hears this, but, but this turns into something different. It turns into deep, deep complaints. Grumbling is like whining, like whining on that road trip. Grumbling turns accusatory. When you grumble, you're looking for somebody to blame. And what happens here is they are angry about the situation and despite the fact that God continued to provide for them in each one of those circumstances, they, they just have this selective memory and they go to these, just these incredible extremes. You see that they're all over the place. This is why I think we can relate to this. They're on a spiritual mountaintop. God rescued me. The next thing you know, they got a problem. They're way down low again. Then they go to another mountaintop. God turns the bitter water into sweet and takes them to Elam. And within a few days, they're all the way back down here again. God, where are you? God, do you not love? And they are, they're not going to say that to God, though. They're going to they're gonna look for somebody to blame. And the one that they're going to blame is Moses and Aaron. They're spiritual leaders. Look at the extremes that they go to. Verse 3. This is how extreme they get. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. Man, they went like off the deep end right there. How about let's talk to God about it a little bit before we go to this extreme. But they're moaning to God this. There we sat around pots filled with meat and we ate all the bread we wanted. But now you, they're, they're talking to Moses and Aaron, have brought us into this wilderness. You've brought us out here to starve us all to death. They're hangry. Okay? You ever been there? They're hangry. 
They're not just hungry. They're angry about it. You ever felt that way? You know, and, and they're, but here is the reality. I got to tell you, though, as I read this, I can tell you straight up I would not be a good Moses. God would be like, you want to die? All right, we can, we can work something out. Right, how many of you be just like that? We will arrange some death right now for all of you. Okay, wouldn't be a good Moses. But Moses in his leadership, he's going to cry out to God. Okay, we're going to see this. But here's what I want you to know. The scripture tells us, scripture tells us that when they left Egypt, they've only been out there for about a month, that they had all kinds of livestock. Here's what you got to know. They were not hunger. They, they were craving something they desired, but they had what they needed. And this is the principle that I think is going on here. Whenever there is an uncertainty that is out ahead in the wilderness, much, many of us, much of us would rather go back to a place of the old way of life. And we start craving that, even if it's dysfunctional, even if it was slavery, whatever. We start craving the old because we are afraid of what God is about to do in the new. So we go back to this place. They're missing their old way of life. They have a selective memory. Guys, they want to go back to Egypt. They were slaves. They weren't treated as human beings, but they're acting as if they're deceiving themselves as if every day was a banquet and a holiday. Like they were getting all of this good food that the Egyptians were good to them. You know what they have forgotten? Oh yeah, the Egyptians killed our children. Do you remember that part of the story? The Egyptians would beat us cruelly on a regular basis. The Egyptians made us work like livestock. We were not treated as human beings. All they're doing as they think back on the old way of life is that, you know what? We just at least had some food that we kind of craved and that we desired. We'd rather trust in what we know, even though it, it was not comfortable. We find comfort in the dysfunction rather than trust God in what is out ahead and move forward in faith that he's going to take care of us as we go. This is exactly where they're at. They're missing their old way of life. And, and I think uh, uh, many of us, we, we will do this. I, I will do this. We will begin to struggle when things don't go our way immediately. When life is not making sense right now, how quickly will Will we begin to look back and Satan will begin to whisper into our ears about that old way of life? And he begins to speak to us this temptation to go back to what we know. We'd rather stay in a place of slavery as long as we know what to expect than to trust that God is going to lead us through a wilderness of uncertainty. And this is what many of us will do. We'll find this comfort. We, we, we have a selective memory. We won't remember in the old way of life before I knew Christ and maybe before you, we won't remember the emptiness that I felt I may find some temporal satisfaction in some of the things and some of the sin but we won't remember the emptiness we won't remember the the loneliness we won't remember the lack of ultimate satisfaction instead what we what we we tell ourselves is that I, I, that's satisfied I'm craving that alcohol I'm, I'm craving maybe that, that old way of, of self-medicating with whatever drug, maybe overeating, whatever. Maybe I'm craving that, you know, going back to that place of feeling like I'm a control freak where I'm going to manage every single little thing. I'm going to micromanage everything. I've got to have my hands, I'm going to, you know, my hands on everything. I'm craving this old pattern. We begin to look back, and this is exactly what we're doing. We are craving Egypt. And the Lord is saying, no, I want to take you to the promised land, but you're going to go through the wilderness because I've got, to, I've got to give you a new identity. I've got to train you. I've got to test you. I'm going to refine you. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to wean you off of your past that you crave so much. I'm going to do something in you here. And, and, and Moses gets to this place. He's under a lot of pressure. If it, we don't find it in Exodus, but in Numbers, Moses is under so much pressure. And so many people start complaining against him. Moses even gets to the place. And you know what? This grumbling, complaining, how many of you have found this to be true? It's contagious. It even gets to Moses where Moses says, 
God, I never wanted to do this. Do you know what Moses does? Exactly what they did. Just kill me. That's a whole message for another day. Just moving on, all right? I'm sick of these people, God. That's where he gets. From crying out to crying against. Groaning and grumbling are different. Verse 4, then the Lord said to Moses, look, I am going to rain down. Now, we might be reading and go, here he comes, judgment. Now, watch. Food. Food. I'm going to rain down grace. You know what grace is? Getting what you don't deserve. What did they deserve there? They deserved a spanking, for sure. Okay. <laughs> Didn't they? They deserve something. But God says, look, and you find this at the bitter waters there. You find it there. He doesn't, like, rebuke them harshly. He provides. He gives them one gift. You know what I find? One gift upon another gift upon another gift upon another gift. It's called grace. Guys, this is a picture of our God. Amen? This is what he's like. Even in my grumbling, even in all the mistakes I make, even when I blow it over and over again and I cry out against him, he still is so gracious with me. And he's gracious with them. He brings this food from heaven for you. Food from heaven, bread from heaven. Each day, the people can go out and pick up, I love this, as much food as they need for that. What does it say next? day. There's something he's going to teach them in the daily dependence upon himself. I will test them. Remember that testing is not a pass-fail. The testing is refining. It's revealing the impurities, the character flaws. I will purify them, is what he's saying, to see whether or not they will. This is when I was reading this and I went, "Uh uh-oh. Follow my instructions he's going to give some instructions to follow he's going to wean them off of their old way of life it says this it goes on it says verse 5 on the sixth day they will gather food and when they prepare it there will be twice as much as usual what he's about to teach them and begin to he's not going to uh to to create this as a law just yet until they get to Sinai, but he's going to begin to show them that there is a gift that he is about to give them, and it is called, do you know what? Sabbath. They've been slaves. They never got a day off. God is going to, to show them this. We know that he modeled it for us in the creation account. God didn't need the rest, but he showed us this. And and what I want you to do in this place, see, I want you to see that whenever you begin to trust me daily, right, God's not leading them or leading us into the wilderness to deprive us. I said they were hungry. They, They got thirsty. He's not leading them to deprive us. But what is he doing here? He is going to teach them. He teaches us to depend upon him daily. Daily. Do you remember what Jesus said so 1,500 years later, Jesus said, they said, teach us how to pray. Jesus said, first of all, I want you to say this, our Father. Do you know that they never said that? They would not call God their Father. You, you didn't do that. But Jesus was saying, no, I want you to realize you have a relationship. And then what's part of that prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread. There is a... There's a satisfaction we find in this daily bread. This is where the antidote for my anxiety begins to, you know, to happen because I'm worried not just about what's going on today when I find myself getting anxious. It's about things that are out ahead that are uncertain, that I I want to control, but I feel like they're out of control. And he's saying, no, I want you to be present with me in the moment and trust me for today. Jesus would even say, because tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. But you walk with me today. You trust me today. You release that anxiety to me today. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to give you what you need in this day Verse 6, so Moses and Aaron said to all the people, by evening you will realize it was the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. 
Now you would think after seeing all the miracles, the Red Sea, they would, they would get this. The plagues, they would get this. But, but again, we see selective memory. We see that they're still struggling to believe that, that God would do this for them. In verse 7, in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your complaints. And then look at what Moses said, which are against him. Uh, Moses is like, I know you're complaining against me, but here is the reality. What you're really doing is you're complaining against God. What have we done, Moses says, that you should complain to us? When we complain, when we whine, when we grumble, what we are revealing in that moment is and we may lash out at some others who are around us and even complain against them, but what we are saying in essence to God is there is a discontentment in my soul with where you have placed me at this moment and who is around me. So I lash out at it. There's a discontentment that's being revealed. When we begin to complain, when we begin to whine about our current situation, they weren't looking to God to fill their needs. You know what they were expecting? They were expecting Moses to meet their needs. They were expecting a spiritual leader to do something for them that only God could do for them. And I see this happening a lot of times in our churches where we look to a pastor to, or a spiritual leader or whoever it may be in your life to meet needs within us that only God can meet. And here's what you're going to find. If you expect your pastors to perfectly meet all those spiritual needs that you have, you are going to become greatly disillusioned because we are just as broken as anybody else. And we need the Lord just as much as anybody else. And so he's going on and he's, he's showing them here that he talks about the glory of the Lord. How do, we, how do we see that glory of the Lord? We see the glory of the Lord when we see the provision of God. We see this provision of God in our life when you see the provision of God, do you know what that is a reminder of? The presence of God. When God provides, he's showing his presence with you. Verse 8, then Moses added, then the Lord will give you meat to eat in the evening and bread to satisfy you in the morning. I read that this week and I thought, that sounds like a burger. This, I'm in, okay? What are they complaining about? For he has heard all your complaints. I was reading that and I thought... God hears everything. He's heard it all. The good, and I even have the bad. We all do. Well, Moses again, what have we done? Yes, your complaints are against the Lord, not against us. Then Moses said to Aaron, announce this. Moses said to Aaron, announce this to the entire community of Israel. Now, here goes some instructions. Present yourselves before the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. I'd be like, uh-oh, I'm coming to the principal's office. That's what it sounds like. But this is not what's happening. God, again, pouring grace out. And as Aaron spoke to the whole community of Israel, I love this part. They looked out. Did they look back at Egypt to see this? They, no, they looked out ahead. They looked out ahead whole community toward the wilderness. And what did they see there? There they could see the awesome glory of the Lord in the cloud. Where? In the wilderness. Not back in Egypt. Out ahead. He's saying, I'm not sending you there. I'm, I'm already there in the wilderness. Come to me. In the wilderness. Then the Lord said to Moses, I've heard the Israelites' complaints. That comes up over and over. Now tell them, in the evening you will have this meat to eat, and in the morning you will have all the bread you want, and then you will know that I am the Lord. This is important. Your God. Not just Yahweh, a God. I am your. This is personal. This is about relationship. This isn't about just knowing about a God. This is, I want you. This is what we find. It's in the wilderness where I get to know God the most. It's about this cultivation of my relationship. It's in the wilderness where we know God the most. That's something good to write down, to think about. And many will want to go back to the old way of life. 
But there are many who will decide, and I've met so many of you, that in the wilderness is where you make a choice to press in and really get to know what you believe about God and who he is and what he what he's about and he's revealing his identity to you and he's revealing things about yourself he's revealing this to you you're not a slave anymore you're my son you're my daughter I take care of my kids God is not a deadbeat dad he takes care of us so he makes these promises verse 13 again I know it's a lot of scripture but I think it's we just got to know it. That evening, vast numbers of quail, okay, so it wasn't burgers, it's a chicken sandwich, okay, flew in and covered the camp, and the next morning, the area around the camp was wet with dew, and when the dew evaporated, a flaky substance as fine as frost blanketed the ground. Frosted flakes. Actually, I think it was more like this. And when I think about it, that's what we're talking about. They walk out, the hot sign is on, okay? Krispy Kreme donuts are everywhere. That's why we serve you donuts every week. We're being biblical, just letting you know that. Verse 15, the Israelites were puzzled when they saw it. And this is what they said, what is it? They asked each other. They had no idea what it was. Do you know what, do you know what, what is it? means manna. The word manna is, what is it? That's how it got its name. It comes from the word man, the Hebrew word, transliterated into the Greek is mana, and then what we have here in our English is manna, and it's what is it? And Moses told them, it is the food the Lord has given you to eat. These are the Lord's instructions <laughs> each household should gather as much as it needs pick up two quarts for each person in your tent so the people of Israel did as they were told some gathered a lot some only a little depending upon the size of your family but check this out but when they measured it out everyone had this manna this daily bread just enough they had what they needed those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. Each family had just what it, need, what it needed. Here goes the instruction. Then Moses told them, do not keep any of it until the morning. Don't hang on to this and think that you're going to have it enough for tomorrow because God's going to teach you something that you're going to need him just as much to depend upon him tomorrow as you did today. But some of them... Say it with me. Didn't listen. I think that would be me. I don't listen sometimes. And they kept some of it until morning. But by then it was, well, this sounds appetizing, full of maggots and had a terrible smell. <laughs> Here we go, Moses. And Moses was very angry with them because the camp stunk now. Moses gets up. He's like, they didn't listen. <laughs> why, why did they hang on to it? I think there were some who didn't listen. But this is a big principle right here. I think a lot of them had a slave mindset, and they had to scrounge for what they got. Again, they didn't get as much as they were acting like they used to get. They had a scarcity mindset, so they started hoarding. You remember back like during COVID, whenever we ran out of toilet paper, people were freaking out and we had the potty apocalypse, okay? Because people would go and buy and then, you know, and so this is what they're doing. It's a scarcity mindset. I'm going to take, I'm going to take, I'm going to hoard, I'm going to hoard for myself. And this scarcity mindset comes out of this slavery. Scarcity mindset leads to greed instead of generosity. And greed is always rooted in a lack of trust. I don't trust my father to meet my needs. So I'm going to, I'm going to hoard instead of be generous. We, we've forgotten who our father is when we, when, we, when we do this. Jesus said, remember, our father, our father, he's your provider. Verse 21, 
And th after this, the people gathered the food morning by morning, each family according to its need. And as the sun became hot, the flakes they had not picked up, they melted and disappeared. God didn't have to do that. God was breaking them off of this hoarding. You're going to trust me. You're going to trust me. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much as usual, four quarts for each person instead of two. Then all the leaders of the community came and asked Moses for an explanation. Why are we doing this like this, Moses? This doesn't make sense. Why does it work on that one day? And again, he told them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow will be a, complete, a day of complete rest, a holy Sabbath. So this principle of Sabbath is being introduced to them. In, in weeks, it's going to be introduced to them as something that God is going to mandate for them. But I want you to see that it's a gift set apart for the Lord. So bake or boil as much as you want today and set aside what is left for tomorrow. God was, again, going to show them that when you do this, you're trusting me on that Sabbath. Instead of scrounging and scrapping, you're trusting me, you're resting, you're recalibrating, and you're going to say, God, I'm, I'm trusting you to take care of me on this day. You're going to meet my needs. He's breaking their self-reliance. and He's teaching them dependence upon him. He didn't lead them to the wilderness to deprive them. He led them there to teach them to trust. And so grace upon grace, verse 24. So they put some aside until morning, just as Moses had commanded. This is on that day before the Sabbath. And in the morning, the leftover food was wholesome and good without maggots or odor. Moses said, eat this food today, for today is a Sabbath day dedicated to the Lord. There will be, here it is, there will be no food on the ground today. I'm telling you again, I'm, I'm making it clear. Listen to the instructions. You may gather the food for six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. There will, he's saying it again, there will be no food on the ground that day. Moses gives instructions. Non-instruction listeners, look, verse 27. Some of the people went out anyway on the seventh day. Here we go again. I had this vision of Moses seeing this going on and doing this. <laughs> I said, Will, can you create an image of Moses doing that emoji that does this? You see him behind? All right, Will did that. Okay, it's great. Um, anyhow, <laughs> he's texting Aaron. These people are stupid. Okay, I know that had to be going on, all right? But uh, and with, that, with that emoji, the, the, the face palm thing. So, um, again, they're either not listening or they're not trusting. And it's the same with us. We're either not listening to what God is trying to tell us over and over and over again. Or we've heard it and we're not trusting. And this is what it shows us. They must, I love verse 29, they must realize that the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. There's another grace upon grace. It's a gift. You never got to rest. It's a great, that's why he gives you a two-day supply on the six days, so there'll be enough food for two days. On the Sabbath day, you, you must each stay in your place. Do not go out to pick up food on the seventh day. So the people did not gather any food on the seventh day. They're learning. The Israelites called the food manna. I love this too. It was like what, like coriander seed, and it tasted like honey wafers. I don't think I'm too far off on this right here. Honey wafers, there you go. <laughs> Do you know in Psalm 105, it says that they ate, when it was re recounting this, uh, retelling this, they ate, men ate angel's food. Well, that's angel's food cake, the first to ever be made, okay? Um, Mrs. Moses probably made banana bread at some point. They were looking for uh, an Italian flair. They had manicotti, okay? And there's all kinds of, of, of dad jokes right there, all right? I, I had to tell. Then Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Fill a two-quart container with manna. I'll just make this quick. To preserve it for your descendants, then later generations will be able to see the food I gave you in where? The wilderness. Here's the quick point on this. I won't spend any time on this. The principle is generations behind us, your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, mine, 
they are watching what we do in our wilderness now. It's out ahead of us. The rest of this, it's, uh, I won't read the rest of it. It's just three more verses, but it's a lot more of the detailed stuff. It talks about the generational stuff. And again, the big principle is God provides daily what we need in our wilderness. So if you flip ahead 1,500 years, you're going to find Jesus works this miracle where he feeds thousands of people with fish and loaves of bread. And they're excited about it. Thousands, 5,000 men, probably 15,000 with the women and children that were there. And they're pursuing him because of the physical satisfaction he gave them in that meal. And, and they're going to say to, to Jesus, in John chapter 6, they're going to end up saying to Jesus, show us how you do this. So, you know, who, are you really this Messiah that we've been looking for? In verse 29, it says this, then Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Jesus is talking about himself. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. He just did. Just like their descendants. They still won't believe. We say all the time, I got to see a miracle. Then, I, Man, we're just like them. The biggest miracle is that God has saved me and raised me from death to life. And I can't get that through this thick skull that he can take care of what's going on in my life today. And this is where they're at. Show us this miracle. Show us what you can do. Verse 31, after all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, no, let me correct you. I'll tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and he gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. And Jesus replied, this is big, I am the bread of life. The bread of life. And whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. What he's saying is, I will satisfy you beyond this temporal. I will give you satisfaction eternal. And I'm enough for you in the wilderness. You know, Jesus talks about being the bread of life, and I want you to think about some things. The word of God, we call it the bread as well. And there's some things that I see in this story, so many applications for us. Just really quick, I want you to hear this, okay? you got to get this. This was given supernaturally. That bread of manna was given supernaturally. This is something, the word of God, right? The bread, the bread Jesus, we, we receive him. You also, you can't just look at it and receive the spirit. You've got to consume it. You've got to take it in, and you need to do it daily. Receive it daily. And this is what I think I love most about it. The manna was on the ground, which means this. They had to lower themselves to get it. And it's the same way with Jesus. And he's saying, I have come to be your satisfaction daily in the wilderness with you. But you got to lower yourself to receive it. So I want to invite you to pray with me today. As we, I gave you a lot of scripture today. There's a lot to process. But there's some of you that maybe you have never received the gift of eternal life. Jesus says, he came for you. He loves you. He he didn't come to pour judgment out upon you. He came to give you the gift of grace himself. He said, but you got to receive this. you got to take this. Today is going to be a day for some of you where you realize you can't earn it. You can't do it for yourself. You're going to receive Jesus today in faith as the bread of life. Call upon him now. Lord, I, I need you. I'm lowering myself before you. I need you. I want you in my life. I receive you, Jesus, as my Savior. I, I confess I'm a sinner that needs a Savior. Jesus, I believe you are who you say. Tell him that. You are who you say you are, Lord. I don't even understand it all. I just, I just believe that you are who you say you are. I put my faith in you for my eternal life. 
there's some of you today that uh, you've already received Jesus as your Savior, but in your wilderness, you've been tempted to go back to Egypt. And the temptation is strong. Saying, I want to satisfy you. And this look to me, look out ahead to me. Stop looking back. Some of you are going to need to let go of some stuff that's in your past and stop looking to that to satisfy you because it never will. Some of you need to let go of some anxiety today that you've been worried about and just take in that daily bread. Father, I pray you would meet people right where they are. Thank you for the richness of your word and the example that you've given us through Israel. And it's in your name we pray.